Hello, Internet. Billy Rothard, a.k.a. Rothgar here. No, I am not Gino, that Pinguino Grieco. That fool went and got married and is on some vacation with his new wife. But this is still Deep Listens, and we're still bringing you some great content. I am joined by three friends that have been on podcasts before. I am joined by Devin Begrudgingly Viable DeFrancesco. What's up? That is definitely the right term for me. (laughs) Uh, And I am also joined by John Nothing in Games Makes Me Happy, Krish. That's not true. (laughs) And I am also joined by Tyler, live from my computing toaster, Morgan. Hello. Yeah, so the nicknames aren't as great, but the content is still banging. Let's do this. Why, Why are we here? We are here because Devin and I had a sort of agreement, some sort of a um, a deal that we had. We realized what kind of games that we had not played, and we said, well, I'll play this game if you play that game. And the games were, I told Devin to play Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. It was fantastic. Devin told me to play the first Dark Souls game. And that's what we're here to talk about, is my experience and my friend's shared experience with my first playthrough of Dark Souls and also their respective playthroughs of Dark Souls. So if you want to reach out to the podcast and hit us up, please do so. We are at deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com, and you can find us at deeplistenspod on social media. So, without any further ado, let's jump into this shit. Dark Souls. Somebody besides me who always does the the intro storytelling, give us, like, a two-minute, what the fuck is the story of Dark Souls? (laughs) Good luck. (laughs) Good luck! So, it's either either an incredibly complex narrative spanning multiple ages that has this huge whining mythology around it, or ringing two bells and doing what a snake tells you. Basically. Snake is bae. (laughs) I, I would say it's your an amnesiac who hears a legend and tries to fulfill it, but doesn't really know what you're doing. Yeah, fair. So, I would say that there's definitely a a small intro narrative. You you know, you have access to this world. Um, I forget the name of the of the continent or wherever that you're on. Lordran? Yeah, Lord, yeah, Lordran. Where the lords are. Swag. Okay. Some people can bear this dark mark, like this dark sign that means they're like an undead person. So they can keep dying and reviving and dying and reviving through eternity until they go insane. And the player character assumes the role of one of these people who goes on some magical adventure because of some legend that says one of these undead people will bring about the end or beginning, I forget which one they actually say, of some new age. And so we're sent on this huge fucking obtuse mission to ring two bells and then some good shit happens and then we gotta ignite some fucking fire of the world. All right, that's Dark Souls story. Bye. Now, what is this game actually about? <laughs> Dying? <laughs> Hating yourself? I think, I think this game is actually about like pushing yourself to the limit and perseverance. John? Uh, sort of what Devin said, but a little twist on that of uh getting beaten down but not broken and that's reflected in the hollowing part of the story where the people keep dying but they keep coming back and they just end up losing their minds and becoming hollow tyler uh yeah they y'all both made good points in that yeah a lot of dark souls is um kind of a meta narrative, right? So when you finally go hollow, that's you quitting the game or you don't and you just get to throw your meat sack of a body against bosses over and over and over until you eventually uh, grow enough to be able to defeat them. So yeah, it's it's mostly a story of you abusing yourself (laughs) until you finally abuse everything else more. Yeah, can we talk about people's experiences with that in specific, being abused by the game? I think I had a little different experience than you guys. How how tough was this game for you? 
So I'll start and say, just a big disclaimer, uh, I played with John, and John definitely prevented me from having, like, the worst, ex- like, I get really lost in video games, and that probably would have really messed me up in Dark Souls, but John helped me a lot through that. For the actual gameplay, I never, like, had any point where I was, like, stuck for two weekends and, like, crashed into a boss, like, 50 times. That just never kind of happened to me. <laughs> So I didn't have that aspect of it. Um, do, you, do you remember what the longest, like, wall you were <laughs> smashing against? I remember Kui lag as being really hard for me, but I don't know if that's accurate. Do, do you remember, okay. John? Uh, I don't know. No. We'll get to my experience, but I'm going to say, no, you didn't have much trouble. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so there's there's kind of a rule in Dark Souls where everyone that you get to play the game will be a little better than you were just because it's infuriating. So that's how the universe has to conspire to work. And so, yeah, Devin was one up the chain from John and I was one up the chain from Devin. And I guess I'm at the, the end of this food chain because I sort of quickly broke Dark Souls combat for me. But it had to happen over, like, a very organic progression of things. I didn't, like, find some glitch or hack or exploit. Um, I went through very specific stages of evolving as a player in Dark Souls combat. Now, going back to what John said about your personal experience, did this game beat you up? I didn't think Dark Souls was a difficult game in, like, big air quotes around that in so much as it was a game that asked you so many questions that you didn't have the answer to. And you had to use context clues to sort of put the pieces of the puzzle together to create your own answer for a lot of these problems. And there were multiple answers for lots of problems, right? Um, Is is that, sorry, can I sidebar for a second? Yeah. Is that not a good definition for difficulty? Is how many questions something forces you to answer and the difficulty of those answers? Like... I can't come up with a better definition for difficulty. Um, well, then I guess I'll say that Dark Souls was was the best kind of difficult as opposed to the worst kind of difficult. Because if you play a game that's just like an insane bullet hell shooter with like a one pixel like success rate or like a one pixel frame perfect way to survive the level, that would just be a really terrible way to make something difficult. <laughs> it's funny you say it's this. Just asking you like one impossible question as opposed to a bunch of really challenging questions. Does that make sense, Tyler? Yeah, no, I like that a lot better. So I, I, I would yeah. I find it funny how you describe bad difficulty cuz that's that's kind of what Fury is, even though we both really <laughs> like that game. <laughs> um no, I, I don't think Fury was exactly like that. I think well, we Fury don't had need a to lot get into of, that. Yeah. Anyway, so I don't think Dark Souls was a like 10 out of 10 hard game, unfair. It just asked you lots of questions, and you had to be paying attention or learning or adapting really quickly in order to um, figure out how, how you play this game, because the way the player plays the game was really important in Dark Souls. So I can topic shift for a little bit and talk about um, combat style. Hey, can so, we do John's experience real fast? Yeah, John, hit yeah. us up with some, with okay. some combat experience. Uh, so I got this game on launch. I had I had gotten a PS3 specifically for Demon's Souls, because I was like, oh, that game sounds really cool. I had a really, really hard time with Demon's Souls, but I ended up beating it. I went into Dark Souls, like, oh, I'll have some experience, I'll go in. I got that game, and... I didn't get past the Tauros demon in, like, the first six hours, six, eight hours of play. Like, I was stuck. Every single boss in that game was, like, over 15 attempts. I suck at those games. But I've beaten them all. It's great. (laughs) That's the chosen undead spirit. (laughs) Yep, yep. So clearly John John is the chosen one. Devin, how was your first combat experience? My first combat, like, how many tries did it take? Uh, no, I mean to say, or... like, when you approached the combat overall of Dark Souls, what was, like, one of the first solutions you came to that you relied on for most of the game? Was it, like, <laughs> dodging? Was it using shields? Was it using magic? Well, you know... I think in the beginning, 
I definitely... So I would say, like, uh, I really played this game twice, is what I would say. And I say the first time I played it was just my, my natural being in the game. And then I tried to play this game at Soul Level 1. So when I first played the game, I definitely was very shieldy, very, like, heavy armor. Not heavy, but definitely medium roll. Um, I got, like, Havel's Ring... They let me wear some of Havel's armor and some of the um, the really efficient. I think it's Sealer's armor, the, like red yeah. yep. bottom that everyone loves. Um, and I used the Gargoyle halberd, so I used a lot of like endurance and vitality, and just basically tried to outlast my opponents and turtle and like bide my time and be patient and all that kind of stuff. My first playthrough. Then I played the game at Soul Level One. Where I, it's so level one is basically you play the game that's already, you know, a pretty difficult game, sort of, you know, we already talked about this, but you play it without leveling up once. You start the game in the same way that you started the game, and you have to get as far as you can. I beat, I got about halfway through it, and then I quit for non-game related reasons. Um, but then I went totally light roll, fast, I just used a hand axe and barely any clothes, so I would say I, I really played the game twice, and I would do two very different play styles. So, Tyler, what was your sort of first, um, or one of your earliest recalled combat approaches? And I guess the the real question I should have asked was, you're playing Dark Souls, and you say, I'm coming up on a new boss, I don't know what the fuck this boss does. What's sort of like the first thing you try, your instinct attempt? Like for John, it was... Mash my face against it fifteen times until I figure out how to not li- how to how to not F- die. Fifteen was a low ball. Yeah. I remember. <laughs> I specifically remember Quilog. I think I spent literally four hours straight only fighting her. And it was like double that for Ornstein and Smoke. And Devin's approach was like, "All right, this is gonna be a war of attrition. I have tons of sus- tons of sus- like sustainability, and I'm probably gonna just like slowly." accidentally deal damage to you until one of us is dead and it's probably not me. Woo! Would you yeah, say that's so accurate, John? I, I was uh, Devin's mentee. I don't mentee. know. Oh, okay. um, yeah, I was Devin's mentee, so I was Turtle McTurtleton, king of the turtles. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Owen has never managed to kill me because I spent like 20 minutes on them memorizing the exact combinations of moves that they could do such that I could get one hit on Ornstein's Heine before I could, like, stop yeah. and uh, long enough to try to attack. But that, that changed when I played Bloodborne. Um, so I had my, my pre-Soul, pre-Bloodborne um, Turtle McTurtleton experience, and then Bloodborne taught me that I didn't need a shield, and then it's been two-handing massive weapons ever since. I completely agree. After playing Bloodborne, like, you can't go back to Turtle strats. Yep. So it is really interesting that I, I didn't play that much of Bloodborne, but when I went soul level one, I had to adopt that strategy. Just I really I didn't have the stamina to block because I couldn't ever level up. So blocking really wasn't a great option. I pretty much was always two-handing a hand axe. That That's kind of like a big weakness of the original Dark Souls compared to the rest of them is that the turtle strategy is so, so strong in that game. Well, I think it's I think it's interesting because um, the, the turtle strategy is kind of like a first order optimal strategy. It's something that's good that doesn't require a ton of skill to do that's easy to master but isn't the best strategy um, going forward. Like generally the ideal play style is to just light dodge and dodge through everything. That's what you see a lot of speedrunners and stuff doing with the game. But it doesn't push you quite hard enough to break you out of the turtling and put you into the, um, I'm going to go naked uh, running around with my two-handed axe. Yeah, but... I, don't, I don't think anything in Dark Souls can <clears throat> break you out of that. The shields are so strong. Stability is so high in that game. Yeah. And so... My first combat experience evolved, like, my first playthrough, and I've only played the game once. I hit a little bit of everything, but I evolved in a very specific way. Like, I started the game and picked up my first shield, and I was like, oh, man, shield, so good, right? Perfect. <laughs> Shields are unbeatable, right? You get a shield with 100% physical damage block, and you're golden. Didn't you get the uh, Black Knight shield also? Uh, No. No? 
Okay. You use the tower. Knight yeah, I use the tower shield whatever. like forever. Okay. What is like just like kind of like the general like vanilla good shield. There's probably better shields in the game, but it's like a very vanilla shield that just has a hundred percent physical damage block. And I just roll with that shit forever. And say, you know what? I'm gonna have tons of stamina because I used the ring of favor and protection. I had plenty of stamina, and I had some health, so I could take a couple of hits if I was just playing bad. And I was good. I was just kind of sort of moseying through the game for a while until I got to the Balder Knights and they forced me to level up. They forced me to parry because I couldn't just block them all over the place. I mean, you kind of could, but the Balder Knights made me try out parrying. So now I had parrying in my arsenal and much later in the game, I don't remember the exact spot where I figured this out, but I was like, man, I've got light dodge. This is so good. I don't need anything else. I also got a weapon that made it really nice for me to two-hand. So, not going to talk about the weapons right now, but like a third of the way through the game, I found a really, really good weapon, and I just used that for the rest of the game. Found the Gravelord Sword. And that was just my baby until I beat the game with it. Important note, I did let Billy know, hey, like, the graveyard is a direction you can go in. Because I don't think he'd ever realized that the graveyard direction was, like, one of the possible directions you can go mm-hmm. in. But I did not actually show him where that sword is. And I'm shocked that he just, like, basically walked into the room and just immediately... Basically, the room where it's in, where you can, you know, access it, you just, like, snap right went to it. Yeah, so, well, it was just a comfy, comfy coffin. Who am I as a person? I'm the person who checks, like, every crevice. And I've checked, you know, all the walls, because there was fucking illusory walls in this game. Of course you had to fucking check everything. But over many, many years, I'm talking decades of me playing games, I've conditioned myself to see stuff, right? And it looked different. It had, like, a different texture than the rest of the, um... Like, backdrop around it. I mean, it was really it was really minor, but I was like, hey, I bet, I bet that's interactable. And so I walked right over to it and didn't know anything about it, but it said, it said like, nestle inside. And I was like, oh, shit, all right, whatever, cool. <clears throat> so, yeah, I stumbled upon it organically, but when I figured out that I could, like, I guess, walk up to an enemy, make it start an animation, back out, and then punish it for whiffing, that became 100% of my strat for the rest of the game. And I just dominated the rest of the game until I got to the final boss. And only at the final boss did I adopt the tankiest of tanky turtle strats ever. <clears throat> so I had like a little bit of every single like combat style, but parts of the game forced me to change, and I was willing to accept the change. And I thought that was a really interesting, um, interesting mechanic. And not to go right back to Fury, but I feel like Fury made me do that too. I like both aspects of both those games. So, jumping topics real quick. We talked about um, combat. Now we can get into weapons and, like, equipment. So, I started this game not knowing what the fuck that I was going to spec or what kind of tech tree that I was going for. So, I did, like, the worst thing you could possibly do in retrospect, which is go, like, an all-around build, right? And so, my... (laughs) Res. Yeah, yeah. So, I just... I basically went the, the, the all-around build. I got, like, equal parts, stamina, and strength, and agility, and whatever. I didn't go into magic, because I knew that I didn't really want to go that first run-through. But I decided I went balance, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. And that did a couple things for me. One, it excluded a lot of the really, like, niche tech tree weapons that... I, sh- I, I shouldn't say tech tree, but more like stat-based weapons... The ones that needed, like, 55, 60 strength, I really couldn't use. And the ones that needed, like, maximum int or agility, I couldn't use. But that was fine with me. I got to use, like, a little bit of everything. So I got to taste all parts of the combat of this game. Now, it turns out I needed, you know, X amount of strength and agi to use the Gravelord Sword. So I just kind of lucked into the perfect weapon for me. Based on the playstyle that I was going through for the first game. But... I tried my hardest to mix and match um, armor to give me good resists, because I hated status effects, and good physical defense for weight. 
And that mean that meant that I had to mix and match armor sets, but always, first and foremost, aesthetics was important to me. I had I had to look good. So, Tyler, what are some of the first equipment or stats or some of your earliest uh, combat readiment decisions did, did, did you make in Dark Souls? Uh, I didn't really make decisions. I kind of just did what Devin told me Great. to. And that was Great. the same Seeker robes. <laughs> but, uh, or Sealer robes. Um, but it's kind of a thing for my experience in Souls games in that my character always ends up looking horrifying. So I got the Mask of the Child off of uh, Pinwheel, which is just this <laughs> grotesque, just really sad looking mask. And so I had this uh, that kind of looked like a Greek funeral mask, if you know what those look like. They're terrifying. Um, so, yeah, I had that and then these spiky red robes. And, yeah, my character looked like they belonged <laughs> in that world. They were they were thoroughly disturbing to look at. And I just that's wanna, happened to me pretty much every game since. I just want to emphasize that I was very afraid Tyler was going to quit. In many, many moments when he was <laughs> playing Dark Souls. I mean, you did quit for a while, right? And then you came back. Multiple times. Yeah. yeah. So you so played the I, game free, playing, free patch. Yeah, I the I stopped. I beat Cap Demon pre patch and went. No, I I don't want to play anything in which this boss could exist. <laughs> and nope, the hell out of there. But actually, I um I started enjoying it. You know, Dev, Devin said that he thought I was going to quit, and. So he was giving me a lot of advice, but I actually started enjoying it the most when I like slipped the leash a little bit and started <laughs> venturing out because when I um, when I felt like I was getting a lot of advice, you know, my my explorer vibes weren't working and I didn't feel like I was earning everything. But then once I did, I started enjoying it a lot more, and the rest is many hundreds of hours. <laughs> John. Uh. My equipment was pretty boring. I did the standard thing of, like, medium armor, shield, and, like, I had a falchion. I think I eventually went to the Quilog's uh, uh, unique falchion. Uh, one thing I did do, though, I killed Ornstein second so I could buy his armor. I bought his armor, and I was like, oh, this looks cool. It has great stats. I was using it. It annoyed me so much because it has really loud footsteps. It is, like... <laughs> Clink, 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 clink. Everywhere you walked, I wore the ring to give yourself silent footsteps for, like, the last quarter of the game because I was so mad at listening to that, but it looked so cool. Wow. Commitment to aesthetic. I can appreciate that, John. It was worth it. I didn't know that the ring of favor and protection was as broken as it was, so I had I had that free ring slot. Dead. So... I don't exact. I definitely started with Pyromancer, and pretty much every time I play Dark Souls, want to play Pyromancer. The Pyromancer class is just kind of like everything I want. It starts at soul level one. It's so easy to mold, and it really gives you the ability to just turn your character into anything. Um, so I know I got the Balner Knight shield and loved that shield so much. That was my favorite shield, like deep into the game um i know that i picked up the gargoyles halberd and committed pretty hard to the gargoyles halberd i really liked a lot i I liked that the gargoyles halberd i think if i remember correctly it has a pretty different move set based on if you're two-handing or one-handing and it just gives you a lot of different attack options and i liked being able to decide do I want to attack, like, in a swing? Do I want to attack with, like, a forward jab? Or do I want to, like, spin in a whole circle and hit everybody? I, I really, in my initial playthrough, I really liked all the different options. And I liked how the halberd let me be pretty far away from all my opponents. So, even, I, I, I like to be far away and sustainy and not be super risky because the halberd let me stand pretty far away. Yeah, I was all about risk and reward which is why i ended up being sort of a bob and weave kind of person i mean towards i guess most of the time i was playing dark souls the biggest piece of the pie chart that i was playing dark souls i was two-handing a big fucking huge great sword and i was baiting out 
dangerous attacks and dodging them and then jumping in to punish the whiff. And that's just how I played. And I had to not stat my character or load out my character in a specific way other than making sure that I was light enough to make those nice dodges and rolls and stuff. But I had to, like, condition myself over and over to get better reflexes and instinct and stuff. And this got even more important when I jumped into boss mode or unique enemies. And now I want to transition into some of those. So when I think about a game like Dark Souls, I don't think about a like a boss rush kind of game, but I think this game is highly punctuated by its critical fight, its boss fights. So it's very much punctuated by this. Usually you you complete a boss or you get to a boss and you unlock a new area. Pretty standard in game mechanics, like, you know, like a Metroidvania style game, you know, you might go to a boss of a certain area, gives you some new ability to go to a new place. Well, in this game, it kind of just like unlocked a new part of the world most of the time. Or said you can go to, or said you you can go some new direction, which is which is pretty cool. But the bosses that stood out to me the most were Sith for sure, or Sith I think Wolf Amaterasu. Oh, Sith. Sith stood out to me. I remember Gaping Dragon, and that's for a really different reason. <laughs> I remember um, Asylum Demon a lot as fights that stood out to me. Um. Obviously, ONS also stands out. I'll, I'll break down two of those, and then I then I want you guys to go. So let's do. I'll, I think I want to do. I'm not sure if it's Asylum Demon when you're there the first time, or when I went back the second time. But when I went back the second time, I cared the most about my sort of like my positioning in a fight because of how much they could like that Asylum Demon could like blow like a wave of heat at you and so you could just get right up under them and kind of like cheat your way out of the hitbox of it <clears throat> and so that let me learn like oh man if you're like right under their feet sometimes you're super safe the secret to every boss in the game yeah get just like them on get, their feet. R- get right under them and then you're then you're usually all right and so that's the first boss that made me think about that and then Gaping Dragon is a boss that I kind of cheated on because in that part of the game I used like a whatever you call a summoning or something and some other player helped me help me beat it. I just want to come out right now and say I just hate summoning. I understand that it has its place, but I personally am like so far in the anti summon camp. No, you're wrong. Anti, but... anti you summoning or anti other people summoning? I mean, it. I guess I would say, like, first playthrough of the game, I really feel like if you... Uh, I feel like the average person that is summoned just kind of, like, beats the boss for you. Especially, m- maybe it wouldn't have been that way, like, on launch. Because maybe most of the people that you were summon, summoning would be, you know, not significantly far off your level. <clears throat> but I feel like any time I summoned or any time I saw anyone else summon, it would be some super overpowered person that would just crush whatever that person was struggling with. And I feel like... That is really, because you played it so late. Yeah. Yeah. So now, I didn't summon because I found Gaping Dragon. I summoned because I said, you know what, this part of the map is just kind of shitty, and I want to make this part of the game more fun, so let me do something different. I think that was the first time you got to see those, like, basilisk, bug-eyed frog monsters that can give you curse. I was like, man, this game is shit. I was like, man, this this part of the game's kind of shit. Let's make this more fun. And so I said, well, I'll just do a summon. And then as soon as I did that, the person was like, oh, okay, I know where we are. Let's go fight Gaping Dragon. And I just sort of followed that person, and they took me right to the boss and just instantly killed it. And I was like, oh, all right, thanks, dude. Um, See you next time, I guess. And that was it. Now, as a grindy completionist person... I don't feel bad about it, but I wouldn't do it again, right? So I'm a little bit in the Devon camp for your first playthrough, but my intentions were definitely pure. I was definitely saying that this part of the game is kind of not so fun. Let me try to make it more fun by bringing a friend along. We'll just fight these fucking basilisk dudes together. Nope. They took me straight to the boss and like two shot it for me. 
So, yeah. what are some of your guys' boss experiences? I know that uh, John and Tyler both like, what is it, Capper Demon or whatever? No. God. Tyler <laughs> loves we Capper, Capper Demon. We played a pre No affection for the Capper awful. Demon. <laughs> well, I missed Capper Demon altogether. Because you took because Master Key, despite me telling you not to. Oh, yeah, I took that item. Sure. Lucky you. <laughs> so, so for me, there's essentially two bosses I want to point out. Uh, there are a lot of bosses that fall into the category of they were really, really, really hard and took me a while. But one in particular, I think, encompasses all of them, and that's the – where is it? The Sanctuary Guardi- Guardian? This is – you go to the DLC – and you walk into the DLC zone, and it's literally like a five-foot walk. Nothing to do. Fight the boss. Uh, for me, when I was coming back to that game, my New Game Plus character wasn't ready for it. So I was just playing through on like a character was near it. I went into that, and that boss was so hard for that specific character. And that was – that represented so much of that game to me where I, I paid for this DLC – and I literally couldn't play it because I sucked too much. <laughs> that, that, that stood out to me a lot. Uh, the other boss, also in that DLC, uh, Artorius. Uh, that is... I think a lot of bosses in Dark Souls 1 have the problem of you can just mush your face into them and sit at their feet and you're generally safe. Artorius is kind of like the first of boss fights that become more frequent in the future games where they kind of figured out like how to not do that Artorius has a lot of lore behind him like he looks really cool and most importantly he has like 30 like different moves he can do like it is so varied it feels like you're really fighting something rather than like this boss that you know, was like okay it has these four attacks look for the tell I really, really, really liked Artorias. Yeah, I was, I was going to talk about Artorias too because I, I think that boss fight is pretty much perfect. Like that's just about everything you could want from a video game boss. You yeah. has a wealth of lore so that you feel like you're, you know, fighting a character that actually has a major part in the story. It has so many different moves and they're so cool and kind of force you to act in ways that you don't normally do. It feels like a exam for a lot of things that you were taught. Uh, less difficult versions of in the past but you have to put to the test in new ways that get mixed up every time and yeah i just love the crap out of artorias um reminds me actually of virgil from devil may cry 3 <clears throat> and gwen if you if you don't yeah. carry yeah, gwen, yeah, yeah, yeah. he's kind of I the agree. same way um and yeah that that's what i did my first playthrough because you know uh, it's a pretty common strategy to fight Gwyn. Most bosses in Dark Souls aren't parryable, but Gwyn is. Um, so you can kind of cheese him by just parrying him like four or five times and killing him that way. But if you don't, then he's a really cool boss with a really diverse set of moves that are really awesome. You know, he's got a giant flaming sword that he swings in these great blazing arcs at you. It's just just a cool fight. You have to... There's a bunch of dark knights outside of his um, area that um, have uh, you can get them to drop shields that are allow you to effectively block his attacks and yeah that whole thing is just set up perfectly but you can parry him <laughs> it, yeah that made me call out or Artorius instead of him but the thing that Gwyn does have is an amazing song his theme is really great I really like that kind of like piano piece and it's so perfect for finally reaching the end of the game and it really is kind of bittersweet killing Gwyn who if you kind of figure out the lore it's kind of sad how you're killing him Devin what boss stood out to you so I don't remember the name of this boss this is the counterpart to the asylum demon that you fight in the in like your very first fight where you can just get under him this is the time when you go back through the weird way and fight that guy again Stray it, demon. It's different. Yeah, it's a different. He's, he's a different guy, but it's, it looks similar. Stray <laughs> demon, 
and he has this magic attack that he, depending on where he has, like, a, his staff, staff or whatever it is, yeah. yeah, it is, like, has a slightly different shape, <laughs> and that boss really forced me to get my positioning down. My positioning was kind of sloppy, I feel like, before that, and that, I feel like that was actually one of the bosses that really just, like, forced me to level up, which is kind of what we talk about a lot, and actually pay attention to my positioning, and I feel like before, a lot of times, I was paying way more attention to what the what the boss was doing, and well, you know, like where exactly I was, because I could just shield or whatever. But the fact that his attack was magic meant that my hundred percent shield strat was not gonna work anymore. That that boss really cements the stand on their butt strategy, because that yeah. is the best place by miles to stand on him. Yeah, that boss, unlike most of the others, isn't get right under him. I think if you get right under him, he has, like, a slam attack that's kind of hard to get away from if you're right under him. So he kind of mixes it up a teensy bit, where instead of being literally right under his feet, you need to be just, like, on his butt. But, um... Other than that, I I really feel like y'all got a lot of the ones that I would say I feel like I I can just do one. Uh, yeah, I'll say about Gwyn, uh, when I fought Gwyn, I could not do the same strat that I'd done for the other huge part of the game, which was wait for them to do an attack and just, like, bait out a whiff and then go back in for a punish. Because <clears throat> his mobility was so different. His mobility was, I don't care where I'm standing, I'm just going to walk slowly towards you, and then when I want to attack, I'll just rush at you. Like, basically fly at you. And so... What I ended up doing was saying, okay, <clears throat> I am not doing a good job of fighting Gwyn right now. Do something totally fucking different. And so I equipped, like, full Havel set, like, f- like heaviest, dumbest armor that I could possibly find. No shield. I think I just put on, like, the grass shield or whatever to let me have more stamina recovery. And I would just sit there and slash my sword at him. Until my health got low and just drink S just like right in front of him. And he would still be hitting me through like me drinking. And I'd be like, I don't care. I'm I'm out DPSing you right now. And my damage was just good enough that I could just kill him and not care about taking hits from him. Because I had enough physical defense and health. <clears throat> and that was entirely different than the way I played the whole rest of the game. But it doesn't matter. Because you beat Dark Souls. And that's the next topic that I wanted to, to jump into. How did you guys feel after you beat your your first Dark Souls game? Uh, well, I I should go last because this was not my first Dark Souls game. Devin, mine was definitely a little bittersweet because I used the parry strat against Gwen, <laughs> and I definitely <laughs> could feel wow. I just took something that could have been really cool and just made it not cool at all. But um. If I remember correctly, I became, like, a Dark Souls evangelist briefly, and basically just, like, got everyone that I knew and told them to go play Dark Souls, and I even went into the SL1 run um, pretty soon after beating it the first time. But I, I would say, you know, the, the main emotion is what everyone feels. It's, like, triumph, you know, um, all that kind of stuff of, like, finally I got through this, you know... I managed to answer all the questions that were posed to me. Tyler. I felt hollow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Damn. Seriously, I I don't get that much of a high off of finishing bosses for some reason. I just enjoy the inexorable conquest of getting through the game, and so then there was no more of that, so I was sad. <laughs> and now Okay. Yeah, John. Well, yeah, so for me, it's it was, like, a disappointment, but, like, I can explain that. Uh, Demon Souls, the final boss of Demon Souls is, like, a, a slug. I don't even think he can attack you. So, like, the, the boss before that is the most savage, brutal thing, I think, maybe in the entire series. He has an attack where he grabs you, insta-kills you. And drains one of your levels. So he could drain away, like, the stat you need to equip your weapon. Beating that dude and then going to the final boss and having it be this slug was kind of disappointing. 
And then going to Dark Souls, uh, when I got up to Gwyn, I was just like, I was fed up with the game. I was like, I just want to kill him and finish it. So I did the parry strategy. And it was kind of disappointing because then you get the ending and you're like, wait, that's not an ending. Uh, I hadn't realized at that time, but the thing I really like about the game is not the challenge or like the conquest of defeating it, but it's the aesthetics, it's the world they created, the lore, the look, everything, like just exploring it and poking around every corner is great. So actually beating it has always kind of felt disappointing, except for Dark Souls 3, because that end is really awesome. So, when I beat Dark Souls, I, like, take a step back and realize that I'm a completionist, and I like to 100% games, and it's impossible to 100% a Dark Souls game reasonably. So, I said, I said to myself, and this is a big examination of why I wasn't sucked into it for 10 different playthroughs. I realized that this was, an, like, an, an unattainable thing to achieve true completion of Dark Souls, and I sort of resigned myself to saying, I have this, like, unique fingerprint of an experience, and it's mine. And if I played through the game again, I would just get such a degree of diminishing returns that I don't want a part of that anymore. So, I kind of felt like, alright, hey, I'm just done. I can play a game like Fury over again, or Valda's Story, over again, or other grindy games. I'm, 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 I'm going to throw out a really old grinding game, fucking like um, Fantasy Star Online. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah? That cancer. That game, I probably put in more hours than any other game I've played, with the exception of uh, Super Smash Brothers or Dota. I don't know, maybe even close to Dota, because I've played that game for, like, years. Fantasy Star Online, I just dumped multiple hundreds and thousands of hours into and made multiple characters and started from the ground up over and over again. Because I just loved the grind. But here, I, it wasn't the same. Dark Souls you can pour hundreds and thousands of hours into, but I wasn't tempted to because something was different about the closure of Dark Souls. That I just didn't need any, any, any more of it. I don't, really, I don't really fully understand what it was that, that made Dark Souls different, but it definitely didn't, um, it didn't capture or harness my grindfather instinct the same way other games have. And that was surprising to me. I will say real fast that it did capture your grindfather instinct in that I literally watched you, I don't know how many hours it was, but I mm. feel like it was at least multiple hours of you just sitting there in <clears throat> the place, uh, in the, the painted painting? world. Yeah, in the painted world, and just massacring those uh, shield guys that would all like be a phalanx massacring them so many times i don't know how many times you did that but it, it probably it was, 300 uh, times fuck t- yeah <laughs> oh, God. um really well i found just really like, really really easy I, way to kill them all i was saying i was about to say like oh that's so encouraging <clears throat> that you have finally found an experience in a game that's suppressed your grinding instincts and if only you could apply that to other games there are grinding games but a lot of games you shouldn't do that but i guess you did grind pretty hard <laughs> i think i was like level 90 or 100 or something when i beat the game i think that's not too high i think your average people are around 80 when they beat it yeah, so when I beat the game, or I should say it like this, I definitely grinded in the first two-thirds of the game. I think I got to high level early. Because <clears throat> I found as many exploits as I possibly could to, like, ramp up my levels and exploit things all over the place. So I said, oh, great. I have a way, like, a quick, like, loop that I can get, like, 50,000 souls per loop doing this. Great. I'm just going to do this. 200 times and get 12 levels today. Yeah, I did that. That made me get to the... That made me get to the end game in the mid game. So I was sort of like 
there was a part of Dark Souls where bosses just stopped getting hard at all because I was just too powerful for them. Well, that, Devin, that's also Devin just test. what happens. <laughs> yeah. There's there's a pretty steep plateau after uh, ONS. <clears throat> but, yeah. like, ONS or Cena Small, like, were not hard for me. I was just kind of out-damaging them. It still I, took you the same number of tries as me, and I would say they were hard for me, so... Uh, it took me two and maybe, like, a bonus try. That's a lie. It took you three tries. <laughs> <clears throat> so, it, it makes took... me so sad every time I watch one of you guys fight these bosses and kill them in, like, one or two attempts. It was so sad. So when I fought Ornstein the Small the first time, I died. Fair enough. I just I got killed. It happens. Second time, killed Ornstein's. Uh, no, I killed Small first, then Ornstein. And I got Ornstein to the point where I had one like hit left, and I said, no, no, no. I'm going to finish him off in like a cool way. Devin, just watch this, and I'm going to beat it in two tries. When you did it in three, just watch this shit. Famous last words, I got fucking murdered. Because I was doing something flashy, and then I like fucked it up and got instantly killed. <clears throat> so I really beat them in my heart <laughs> on my second try, and then I had to confirm it on try three. <laughs> no. So so many – everybody eh. – there's a mantra of don't get greedy. Oh, yeah. Every, I, everyone's had that experience. I got greedy. Yeah. It happens. Well, so we're, we're all Monster Hunter players. We should – to know, <laughs> but no, we are all. You, you never player. learn. You just get better, which makes you more greedy, and then you regress. <laughs> yep. So let me do a hot um, topic switch, and Monster Hunter is a good game to do this with. <clears throat> so I was kind of on the fence about the Dark Souls UI. Oh, God. <laughs> um, and I'm gonna draw. Monster Hunter as sort of a direct comparison of real of like real time menuing. I think Dark Souls actually did, did did an okay job of real time menuing. I think the Monster Hunter games are games that I play where I really did not like their real their real time menuing. So if you don't have a hard pause in the game and you have to do your do your men do your menuing while enemies could be around you, <clears throat> I like how. Dark Souls did it more than I like how a game like Monster Hunter did it. Um, I like how Dark Souls did comparing items to one another more than I like a game like fucking Mass Effect menuing, which is like abysmal. How Jesus. Did, how did Dark Souls compare items? <clears throat> how was that? Just your damage number? Uh, Dark Souls compared items by letting you see like what they're like, what their raw attack was going to be, and like what what armor would give you what stat, and then it compared to whatever you had on, so you could see. Eh, eh, I'm pretty <clears throat> sure it didn't compare it. It just told you if it was better or not, not by how much. Uh, well, it had like A, B, C, D, right? I'm right, not talking about that stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm talking about like the numbers on weapons and armor. Like you would just look at your new one that you're looking at. And it would just say, like, it's better, but it wouldn't actually show you the other one. Oh, like it wouldn't show you how much better? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, yeah. Dark Souls menus are crap. They're garbage. <laughs> they Look, they're not great, but what other games... So, like, what games do it do it better? Um, I think that... don't the Doesn't um, Path of Exile show you really nicely what the stack comparisons yep. are? That's a game with pretty with pretty decent menuing. That's also in real, in real time. Um, the elder some of the earlier Elder Scrolls games have pretty pretty terrible menuing because there's lots of like pop ups and lots of confusing like menus and stuff. And <clears throat> a game like Dark Souls is kind of minimalist, even though it's um it's, like tricky to understand what's going on at first. I. Uh, not sure minimalist is the word. Like, Dark Souls probably has more stats on your character that you're supposed right. to manage than just oh, about well, any other RPG I, I can think of. What I will say, though, is that even though the menus are crap, I'm not going to say they're, like, crap on purpose, but even though there are, like, a million stats, 
having them having the menus be bad and difficult to compare kind of helps because the individual numbers don't really matter in this game whereas you mentioned path of exile that's like it's all about the numbers and you better be able to compare stuff because it's super important not being able to compare stuff like your first playthrough of dark souls might bug you but once you you realize that like you can just pick one thing and use it for the rest of the game you don't actually have to look at other stuff ever yeah i think it 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 was if not intentional it works in dark souls as favor favor in that it's sub, sus, ugh, systemically obtuse in addition to you yeah. know design and geography yeah. obtuse everything like every about part that of game the yeah game is labyrinthian in its own way everything yeah and how did they deliver the story to us they delivered it to us through God. The items and the menuing, right? <clears throat> and that was wait, fine. wait, wait, wait. I, I wanna I wanna take a step back real fast. All right. Because <laughs> I, I think this is an important designation and it's one that I've had a bunch of arguments about. And that Dark Souls doesn't so much have a story as it has a mythology with tiny little things that you tiny little parts that you play. Like it had the the story of Dark Souls is literally I might be the chosen and dead. Let's go try to sort this crap out. Ring two bells. Do what Framp tells you to do. Beat the game. Right. That's that that's the parts where your character has agency over what's going on. Um, but the mythology is huge and expansive and immersive and amazing. Yeah. One thing I, that I, I like. Think last five story. Go ahead, Devin. One thing that I will say. And this is going to be a weird comparison, and I'm going to try to explain why I feel a little bit of a kinship here, if it's not clear. When I walk through Bioshock, specifically, I kind of get to experience the the world. Like, there's obviously a lot more story and actual, like, concrete knowledge in a game like Bioshock, but the ambiance, like, walking through the world and the environmental storytelling, I wouldn't say Dark Souls had environmental storytelling, but I would say the environmental ambiance of the like the feelings that I get when I walk through an area in Dark Souls, it, it may be true that it just has a mythology and not a story, but its mythology isn't entirely in those item descriptions and odd cryptic statements. A lot of the story you kind of get just by accident and osmosis and like, oh, well, this is kind of how I felt around this place. And then once you read, like, two or three items on it, you're like, oh, okay, now it all makes not sense, but, you you know, you get a little bit of it. I'm going to bounce off Devin a little bit and say that I agree that – I I think here's one way that, like, Bioshock and Dark Souls is very much alike, is that if you're in a particular realm of each respective world and you learn one fact, it can drastically change how you feel in that environment. So uh, the Dark Souls example that I'm thinking of is in Blight Town when you're on the ground floor, the swamp area, and you hear that this is actually like where the pyromancers used to live. This is like where the pyromancer dudes always hung out. And when they got all fucked up, this is what the level turned into, like a poisony, terrible place. That made me care about that area more than just being a miserable shithole, because I really didn't like that part of the game very much. And then I said, oh, well, I have like at least a reason to care. I think Power Race is pretty cool, and I'm sorry that your swamp turned all gross. Sorry, guys. When it started off a swamp, it probably wasn't. <laughs> I mean... Don't you say bad things about the Great Swamp. <laughs> <laughs> great yeah. Swamp... It's the Great Swamp. I don't... <laughs> I'm glad we didn't see the crappy swamp. <laughs> uh, I'd like to kind of bring up... a uh, Tyler, at the beginning of the podcast, you called the story like a more of a meta story i i really think that's the important parts of this uh when you call it the it not having much of a story more of a mythology i think that's really accurate of what is actually going on there is not important it's how it's presented to you and the insanity of it and like those are like the themes of like everyone's kind of lost and the themes of the story, not like literally the story contribute 
towards exactly like the feelings you get playing that game. And I think that's like the important part. Like what what is actually going on? It doesn't matter. What matters is that you don't know and you're trying to piece it together and like you're having a really tough time and you you get stuck on a boss and you like forget where you are. It the story of that game is not within the text of that game for me. Yeah, the, there's a quote everyone likes to um, bring in, and it's super relevant here, that Miyazaki, um, the creative director of the Souls series, I guess not too, but um, he he's Japanese, um, and his English wasn't amazing when he was a kid, but he liked to read fantasy books in English. So sometimes he'd have to skip entire paragraphs or entire pages because he just didn't understand what a lot of the words meant. So he said he wanted the Souls games to kind of feel like um, you know, books where several of the pages are missing, so you have to fill in the gaps yourself. And I think it pretty much nailed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I I feel that way. Where I, for me, the story is not definite. It's you take what they give you and you mold something fun and creative for yourself. Yeah, watching uh, Vati Vidya's prepare to cry videos after my soul's experience is like a super important part of the soul's experience. So I just want to do a hot topic switch a little bit. You mentioned um, the Elder Scrolls games briefly. I'm actually going through Skyrim right now and constantly in Skyrim. Probably my biggest complaint about the game is just almost like every five minutes I'm reminded that I'm playing a game. Just like it's so common that Something will happen, and I have to be like, oh, I have to figure out how to play this differently than I would actually kind of play it, because this is a game, and I have to game this. Dark Souls, I'm not saying you don't, it's not gamey, but I, I'm, I'm try, I'm, I wish I could come up with the right words here, maybe someone else can help me out. But, immersion? Yeah, immersion. Like, uh, uh, there's a, there's like a denial of... Dis- suspension of disbelief? N- not suspension of disbelief, but like... The magic like, circle. That's yeah. what's the magic circle? Um, it's I'm gonna misdefine it here, and someone's gonna be really upset with me. But it's essentially, uh, yeah, a um, area that you can define that's a willing suspension of disbelief. So you draw the magic circle, and you say everything outside of that is. I don't need <laughs> to worry about that. I'm. I believe that's it. <laughs> well, it, anyways, um, what I'm trying to say is that. Uh, the way Dark Souls doesn't let you pause, the way you can't really easily just, like, switch your items just anytime you want, the way that healing is a cost, like, you have to pay time, and there's just so much that makes me feel way more like I am the protagonist than in games where, in theory, you would think I'd have way more emotional connection to the protagonist because I have experience their story and you know I, I know all these things about this character and maybe i even like made some important choices about this character you honestly don't make any important choices about your dark souls character that they're kind of just nothing but i feel so much emotional connection to my dark souls character when i play i don't know if anyone else has that but i really do maybe if you compare it to skyrim but <clears throat> eh. i mean i definitely i definitely feel a lot more immersed in Dark Souls than I do in um, Skyrim just because yeah it once it defines its rules you don't have to mess with them too much whereas you know it's it's a little bit easier to get broken out of that loop because of you know some enemy that you just have to cheese a certain way in order to advance not that you don't occasionally do that in Dark Souls but in Dark Souls it feels like you're outsmarting them whereas the way that the Elder Scrolls ends up framing it it's I'm sniping a guy, going back into stealth, sniping him again. And <laughs> it, um, although actually that is possible within Dark Souls. Just <laughs> it's not a p- core part of the game experience. Yeah, so there's definitely a lot of ways you can take the story, the gameplay. Um, the last point that I want to hit at all, really, is auto saving. And this game has some of the most aggressive auto-saving ever. Like, if you wanted to turn back time at all, first of all, you, you just, you fucking couldn't. And if you could, you had to, like, dive to your, like, PlayStation and, like, 
rip the plug out to even have a chance at undoing whatever fuck up you did. I can't tell you how many times I did that. <laughs> Attempting um, bosses and just not wanting to do the walk back. Like, oh, I died. Turn off. Turn back on. <laughs> um, now, I like auto-saving in games most of the time. Most of the times, they are useful. I, um, I'm okay with this auto saving, but it definitely had times where it bugged me. Um, auto saving in this game means that you can't experiment with anything because everything is permanent, right? So, um, shit, what's that other game, Devin, that we did auto saving with differently? Mass Effect? Ma- Mass Effect. It, yeah. You can reload your save, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But It does have auto-saving. It does have auto-saving, but you can re- reload your save. I turned I, I turned auto-saving off in Mass Effect and regretted it. Um, that was because when I played Mass Effect, it had, like, some fatal crashes, and I lost tons of, um, uh, tons of, like, um, pro- progression because I wasn't auto-saving. But then I realized that I could turn it on or turn it off when I wanted to and try some stuff without having to have that panic of, oh shit, like, if I do this and I this is not what I really want, I'm stuck with it forever. In Dark Souls, you are stuck with it. 99% of the time. So, one thing that I love doing is killing NPCs and seeing what happens. <laughs> and you get actual, like, real-world consequence. Well, not real-world, but, like, you get in-game consequences for doing that shit, and you cannot turn back the clock. I love seeing what happens when you kill NPCs, or do something that the game suspects that you won't do, and I feel like the quick save feature, sorry, the, um, the such, such an aggressive auto-save feature took away some of the game value for me. Because I couldn't explore the way I want to. Yeah, I think that's kind of a, a give and take um, because I think having a aggressive autosave like that um, makes the world a little bit more immersive. You feel like all of your actions matter because you can't just roll back, right? You can't do that experimentation. So that gives the world a lot of its like, uh, you know, persistent immersive feel um, that you know everything has a consequence and there's nothing you can do to affect that. So that makes it a lot more immersive for me. I will say in one way, it's actually a little bit freeing. I really enjoy the Fire Emblem series. Um, oh, yeah. And one thing that I... It, it's like, I hate and love it at the same time. Of like, I can't let my characters die in Fire Emblem. I have to restart the level if one of them dies. I just have to. And it was really... It's really freeing in Dark Souls. I never have to consider... Oh, could I have done this slightly better? No, because I didn't dive to my PlayStation 3 and <laughs> unplug it, so I can't really go back. I know that's kind of like a, a dumb reason, but it, it kind of frees me from wanting to have impulses um, that are just kind of like deleterious to my experience. Forcing, the, these, being so aggressive with the auto-saving makes my experience better by not allowing me to do things that are not good for me. So... One thing that I like when a game allows me to control my saves is it's really, really important for me to play a game the way I want the story to unfold. So I'm trying to think. uh, John told me about a gameplay experience that he had where I think I'm trying to... um, Hopefully I'll jog your memory, but you were playing a game and it gave you an option and you knew what option you wanted to do but it wasn't clear what the game said. So you like chose one, and then you said, oh no, I'm going to reload my save, because I knew what I wanted to do, but I I didn't think that that was the answer that would give me the one that I wanted to do. I think it was in a Mass Effect game, maybe? No. I, I, said, I mean, I know what kind of experience you're talking about, but I don't know the specific example you're thinking of. Either way, I'll just finish the thought and say... The way I play a game matters because I want it to be my story unfolding. And so, similarly to how if an, if an author writing a novel has to 
try to get the the reader to buy in as soon as they do something that the reader doesn't agree with or wouldn't do themselves they kind of lost some of that buy-in and i would lose some of the buy-in if the story ever went somewhere that i said oh man like i i wouldn't have done that had i been able to think better or think about my options more and so i'm usually turned off if a game takes me a story direction that i didn't actually choose or wasn't prepared to to do or I didn't get to see all the options. I usually hate that a lot. It's a big, big turnoff. And that sort of um that that didn't happen here that often, but it's stuff that I wish I could do and ex- explore more, but I didn't get to in this game because of the aggressive auto saves. I will say I had a similar I, I said something similar to that maybe this is what you're thinking of. I got really frustrated with heavy rain of all games because the like dialogue options you only had like i don't know how many seconds like 10 to 15 seconds to make your choices and like the dialogue options like move in your way and i knew what i wanted my character to say but i had like 10 seconds and the dialogue options were moving and uh, 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 and i ended up doing something that i would have never done so I can kind of forget what you're saying. Yeah. I'm blanking on the name of the game right now, but that type of game, like a recent one, solved that problem. I, wow. Oh, Life is Strange, where you can make a decision where it's like, oh, I didn't think it was going to go that way. And it's literally a mechanic of the game that you just go back and do it again. Two games that I played recently that I liked were Ori and the Blind Forest, which lets you load your saves based on each save you make. And Talos Principle did that too. You could like go back in time, not just to your previous save, but to like any number of saves you had. So like, yeah, I, I, I like that a lot, but this game did it, and I understand why they did it. It just, it kind of bugged me sometimes. So other topics of discussion, I think some of you guys mentioned you wanted to talk about the walk-ups. Yeah, yeah, I had something to say about them, which is something that I can only say because I'm not actively playing a Souls game right now and therefore not, not yeah. forced to do any at the moment. But um, I was playing Titan Souls, which is a game that is not in the same series but definitely emulates a lot of aspects of Dark Souls. It's basically Legend of Zelda plus Dark Souls, which is a lot of people's cup of tea. Um, but the important part about... so. Um, when you die in Dark Souls, you go back to a bonfire and you have to walk back to the boss's room, which sometimes can take a while. But um, the important thing about, about that to me is that you were forced to make the decision to go back into the boss room, right? If it if it spawned you right out directly outside the boss room or inside the boss room, then you wouldn't really feel like you're making the conscious choice to go back and fight the boss again. But because it spawns you, you know, a distance away. You feel like you're actively making the choice to go back to the boss, not grind more, not explore another area. It really makes those options apparent to you as opposed to throwing you right in, which I feel like, although it's very frustrating when you're playing it, ultimately makes the whole thing a bit more tolerable because you feel like you have that choice to have the agency in that scenario. I, yeah, kind of pointing out about the boss walks... Um... They, if they weren't there, the game would be a lot shorter. Uh, now, <laughs> what a disaster! Saying, like, I'm not saying they like just pad out the game length. Uh, just padding out the game length would be bad, but I think the walks make you kind of remember it more, and like you walk through their area, you have the big lead up and anticipation of your next attempt and fight it and it goes wrong and it it just makes you kind of like stew in that area longer it makes it more memorable by having the walks as opposed to just like up oh, respawn at the beginning of the fight like just keep doing it until you beat it you beat it up oh, now it's over do the next thing <clears throat> yeah yeah that anticipation's really important i think one thing that I enjoy about the walks, it, it, not in all levels, but in some of them, there's like a really satisfying sense of mastery that I feel 
after having to do the walks a couple of times. For example, in some zones, like, I could really only get to the boss by SSing, like, three times, and I take all this damage. I, like, kind of just, like, get there, like, half dead and, you know, be ready to fight the boss. But really, I'm, like, I spent half of my resources just getting here. And then I fight the boss, and that was a slog, and that didn't go really well. But if I have to... Like, that gives me a really identifiable place to improve of, well, if I could just get to this boss and only have to SS once, or only have to SS, you know, no times if I started to get pretty good at it, um, I, I really feel like that's an interesting aspect of the game. Though I do feel like the more important aspect of the walks is what John said of making you feel more immersed in the area and getting a deeper emotional connection to the area. Now, we we can't talk about boss walks without talking about the worst worst one capra demon that is everything wrong about those boss walks of go in and fail an attempt and have to walk back up capra demon is fight your way up to him go in the boss room die in 0.5 seconds and have to do the walk again that boss walk is the worst it has to be mentioned that's honestly one thing that I feel like that's the only reason I haven't gotten further in Fury is because I'll like really master a couple portions and then get to a portion that's bad that I'm kind of bad at and die really quickly. And then I feel like, well, I have to spend another like three minutes. It's nowhere near compared to a Dark Souls walk up, but it's just frustrating to like you fully, you fully mastered an area or a boss fight or you know something like that, but then just get completely creamed in 10 seconds in another section. Fury may not have been it, the best example, yeah. but that's the, the most recent one that I've had. The, the boss yeah, I mean, feels so bad when you feel like I learned nothing from that attempt. Like, you have time to think about it as you're walking back up, but when you don't learn anything because you die in one second because the dogs pin you and Capra one-shots you, it's terrible. It's just time for your rage to boil. Yep, yep. <laughs> I never had, like, a really terrible walk-up experience. I had times where I feel like my exploration was hindered, and so I'd say, well, fuck it, I'm just gonna, like, uh, go to the boss, and I'll just get stronger and come back here. And so I kind of had, like, the reverse of it. Like, I would choose to do the walk-ups because I just knew how to do that, and if I wanted to do, do, do the fun stuff, I would just do it later. So that was kind of my take on it. Anything else about Dark Souls? I can't think of any other major topic points right now. So uh, in conclusion, for me at least, this is my first Dark Souls experience. And it was pretty unique because I got to play it a lot of times in a vacuum. And then a lot of times with a friend next to me who had played it before, and a lot of times with the help of some guide or NPC or, sorry, not NPC, like um, another player character doing something for me. So I got a lot of different tastes of this game and from a lot of different perspectives. Maybe that's why I don't feel the need to play it over and over again because I got so much of what I think the game has to offer in just one go. And there's still a lot left that I haven't experienced, but... I took a big old bite out of Dark Souls, and I'm full now. <clears throat> Tyler. That's because you haven't tasted Bloodborne. <laughs> <coughs> I guess you're right, man. So anybody else? Closing uh, cl- closing thoughts. I got, I got two things. One, really quick, I just want to say how much I hate the uh, running around in this game. Exploring is great when you have to like go slow and be careful about where you're looking at, but when you're actually running around, I hate it so much. Uh, the camera does not follow you very well at all, and to run around and use the camera, you have to do like a claw thing where your natural way to hold a controller is to have your thumb on the left stick thumb on the right stick, like sometimes take your thumb off the right stick to hit buttons, but you gotta hold B 
and do the right stick. So you have to do like a thumb on your right stick and then move your index finger up so it's no longer gripping. It's like hands aren't meant to do that. You mean the like, please the fix pro it. halo grip? The the claw. The claw. I know it's not anywhere close to old school Monster Hunter claw. Tyler probably has nightmares about that, but uh, I hate the claw. Uh, the other thing I want to bring up is uh, this game is really significant. <laughs> I have the but, broken fingers to prove it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think this game is significant, but it's important to recognize that it's not like a revelation uh, there are a lot of things I think this game draws from lore and aesthetics wise. It draws a lot from uh, Berserk. I got in, I found Berserk after Dark Souls and wow, so much stuff is pretty much ripped straight from it. But more of like on the gameplay side, I want to shout out to Castlevania and playing through those games and then looking at Dark Souls those are those definitely scream out as inspirations of even the old ones but more like uh symphony of the night and the like ds ones gba ones where it was like more metroid style this game feels like one of those in 3d done right down like to every detail yeah i'll say so because you definitely had key points of where huge other aspects of the game are unlocked for you. Like getting the key to some zone or beating ONS so you get access to the like shiny gates or whatever. Yeah. But also more skill lets you get to places. And sometimes in a game like Metroid where they don't really tell you how to shine spark, but you need that to get to some places. Well, they don't tell you how to be good at Dark Souls so you can survive the walk up to a new world either. Gonna have to just get better. Yeah. Castlevania has a lot of the like memorable boss fights, but there's no save room be- before them and the old ones it's like you'd have to play through the whole level. And that's a lot of the same like, oh, you die, start over, like you lost what you had. Similar to how Dark Souls makes you lose all your souls when you die. Yeah. So any other closing thoughts? Well, I was kind of trying to pin down what exactly made um, made people have such a uh, high ideal of Dark Souls, and I think it's the fact that because of how uh, Byzantine it is, all of the bad parts about it just seem like they're adding character, right? Like the the archers in Ann Orlando are pretty objectively <laughs> terrible. That's that's not an experience that anyone enjoyed having, right? It's I, I, have, I have to interrupt you briefly and say Billy just like one shot that area and I was so angry. I, I don't I can't put it into words. I just I guess never got hit. That's a miracle. But but yeah, <laughs> but I feel like that's one of the things that makes Dark Souls feel so great in retrospect is because all of it the rough parts of its difficulty curve just feel like they're adding character. That makes the worst parts of the experience elevated up so high that everything seems good. <laughs> so yeah, that, that really plays yeah. to its favor. Fair enough. Yeah. When Dark Souls is not shitty, you feel great. Yeah. yeah, I'll give you that there are a lot of bad things that some more modern design like Design strategies or whatever could really uh, smooth out the game. Whether they're they would contribute to what I think Dark Souls is, I don't know. But it does have a lot of rough edges. Devin, any uh, final thoughts about Dark Souls? I'll say that I was definitely the youngest, both age-wise and as a gamer, when I played Dark Souls for the first time. <clears throat> and I feel like it had a deeper impact on me as a gamer than it probably did on any of you guys. I mean, maybe not John, because he's played literally every Souls game from Demon Souls forward. But I guess I would say it. Dark Souls is kind of one of those things that it was Byzantine, it was dumb, a lot of things re- needed to be improved... But I guess one thing that Dark Souls really gave me was that, like, 
I know that the conquest of me wasn't as important to you guys, but it really was very important to me, and it really taught me that like I really can beat games that I would have never thought that I would have been able to beat, especially before playing Dark Souls. I had really never beaten a game that I would call hard before, so it was really important to me as a gamer. All right. Well, that about does it. Uh, I can't think of anything else to say about Dark Souls, and everybody had a nice little piece sort of hit it off on. So that's going to be all for tonight. Um, yeah, Dark Souls was an interesting experience. I'm glad that Devin and I traded games here. Maybe we should do one about Ocarina, and I'll make uh, Gino play that game too. That'd be, that, that, that'd, be, that, that, that'd probably just be really fucking cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <clears throat> so I'm going to wrap this up. Um, if you want to hit up the Deep Listens podcast, you can do so by emailing us at deeplistenspodcast at gmail.com or at our social media at deeplistenspod uh, on Twitter and everything like that. Also, you can leave us comments on our Libsyn page and all that good stuff. Uh, rate us on iTunes or on iTunes and all that other good, free, podcasty download, social media like Radio FM and Stitcher and all that good stuff. So... Hit us up there. Leave us some feedback. We'll do more stuff like this, more sort of what's your experience of this game. And, uh, yeah, I think that's it. So thank you. Thank you, John. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Devin. Good to be here again. Thank you, Tyler. Always glad to be on. And I am Billy Rothard, a.k.a. Rothgar. Uh, that's going to be all, folks. So till next time, peace. Peace.